Hancock's Neighborhood Market, and Perry's Floors, and more. And a very good Tuesday morning to you. Welcome to Tiger Talk at nine minutes past the hour. And uh, we certainly are glad to have you along with us on WPKY. I have the pleasure of welcoming into the WPKY studios. Been a regular monthly guest now. It's Richard Nelson. He's the director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. Good morning. Good morning, Ty. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Isn't that weather beautiful out Man, there? I tell you, I went home uh, yesterday afternoon, got off work, and I got the lawnmower out and uh, got a finish with the weed eater this afternoon maybe but boy it was uh, just i took advantage of the weather this feels like a summer up in wisconsin my home state where it's uh, uh mild uh humidity's low you get a nice breeze and yeah. just gorgeous weather so it, it really is going to get warmer as we head into the week and but the nice thing is we're, we're drying out a little bit you know we've had lots yeah. of rain and yeah. uh, get these uh, farmers be able to get be pretty productive here this week yeah it's a good week good week for all of us farmers uh, regular people that aren't farming and it's good to be on the radio with you as well. Well, it's a so. pleasure having you. And of course, uh, uh, Mr. Nelson is the director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. And uh, as we begin this morning, I will, uh, uh, you know, want you to kind of tell the folks that may not have heard our show before or your yeah. show yeah. Uh, here on Tiger Talk, uh, your, your segments, uh, what the Commonwealth Policy Center is and what it stands for. And yeah. uh, then we can kind of go into your agenda as to what you want to talk about. Sure, sure. The Commonwealth Policy Center tie started uh, uh, in 2012 with the dual goals of, first of all, raising up principled leaders, conservative leaders to serve in our state legislature, primarily the state house. And we do that by recruiting, training, and then helping uh, elect uh, conservative candidates. Second thing that we do is we join the conversations of the day from a conservative perspective, really a biblical worldview. Uh, when many of the issues that we read about in the paper or hear about on the radio are taking place, we're trying to bring a uh, distinctly conservative, really a biblical perspective to these issues. So we write newspaper columns. We've got three different radio programs. I uh, speak publicly across the state um, uh, to, to, to different venues. And um, really trying to engage Kentucky culture. You know, Kentucky is such an awesome state. We're so blessed here in Kentucky with so many things. Uh, but one of the things that we're blessed with that we take for granted is our freedom and our liberty. We just had a primary election not too long ago, and uh, that's, a, that's a gift that we have, that we can go to the polls and elect our leaders. And yet only 23, 24 percent, I believe, of eligible voters actually bothered to go out to the polls. 23.45 statewide. Yeah, very, very low uh, percentage, and that's really sad. I, I, I think of all of the men and women who've sacrificed to protect our freedoms. You know, you go back to the Revolution. It, it was our founding fathers who they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Many of them suffered great loss. They lost their wealth. They lost homes. They lost plantations. Some lost family members. Uh, they were touched deeply because they sacrificed for freedom, because they wanted to be a self-governing people. They f felt that the king was tyrannous and wasn't upholding their rights, so they stood against that. And I know it was over a couple hundred years ago, two, what, two 234 years yeah, ago, yeah. Yeah, something better. like that. And uh, it seems like such a long time, but that gift is still just as precious today as it was back then. And so at the Commonwealth Policy Center, we're trying to remind Kentuckians that we indeed have a gift. Uh, we have blessings of liberty. We also have a creator who's given us these, these blessings, who's given us these gifts. And we need to take these gifts seriously and work to protect them and to defend them. All right. Well, good deal. Uh, lots of things in the news, news-wise, newsworthy. We can start wherever you want, on the national scene, on the state scene. Uh, wherever you feel it's appropriate, but, uh, you know, big, big, all kinds of big news uh, 
uh, coming down, you know, the, the Supreme Court decision yesterday was big. Uh, of course, there's some statewide things that are going on, so let you take it to where you want to. And again, we'll just say that these opinions expressed here uh, by, by the Commerce for Policy aren't necessarily the pin opinions uh, of WPKY, its owners or managers. It's just, uh, it's, uh, you know, ju it's a show. Yeah, yeah. I think the biggest news story, Ty, is <coughs> coming out of uh, Washington, D.C. yesterday. The U.S. Supreme Court vindicated Jack Phillips, the Colorado cake baker, of his claims that uh, he, uh, his religious freedom and conscience rights were violated by the state law. Uh, and just to, to back up and to unpack this, uh, Jack Phillips is uh, uh, the owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop. Back in 2012, he was approached by a homosexual couple that wanted him to bake a cake for a gay wedding. Uh, actually, he learned about this when he sat down to consult with him. They approached him, he set up a meeting, and they talked about um, what they wanted. And after he learned that, hey, this was for a, for a gay wedding, he said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I, I will sell you anything in the shop, uh, cookies, uh, brownies, anything off the shelves you can have, but my conscience says that I cannot do that because what I'll be doing is participating, I'd be participating in something that's sacrilegious. And uh, they were offended by that. They took their case before the, eventually before the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. And the Colorado Civil Rights Commission found him guilty of violating the civil rights of, uh, of that gay couple. Um, after the court uh, looked at the details and, and saw what really went on, uh, Jack was not being arbitrary. He had, had actually declined to bake cakes for other things, like um, other things that were objectionable or immoral. Uh, Halloween cakes, that was a, that's a big season for, for bakers. He didn't do anything with Halloween because of his religious convictions. He now, just felt like he didn't, just didn't want to do those. Didn't want to do it. And just like you or I, we may have different convictions on these things, but Jack had a conviction on what he thought was appropriate to use his business skills, his ability, his time, and he didn't want to do that. Uh, interestingly enough, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission said that Jack's beliefs uh, were similar <clears throat> to those who hid behind religious beliefs to uphold slavery, uh, certain beliefs that perpetrated the Holocaust. And uh, one commissioner called his beliefs despicable. When the U.S. Supreme Court saw the transcripts of the hearing with Jack Phillips, they uh, said, look, this was not neutral government. This was actually people who were bigoted, and uh, they were not being fair to him. This was, this was not right. The other thing that the court did was that they found that um, there actually is religious freedom that extends into the marketplace. There are many who say, well, keep your religious freedom, religious values to yourself. But once you open up a store, once you put a shingle out and invite the public in, your religious beliefs end. Uh, the court said, no, that's not true. You do not check your religious beliefs in at the door once you go into business. That applies uh, into the marketplace of ideas. Uh, another important point, and this is so important that we get this right, because so many in the mainstream media have reported this as a simple case of bigotry against an individual because of their orientation. It's bigotry against those in the LGBT community in particular. And that's really not the case because Jack had, in the records, it was very clear that he was willing to sell to people in the LGBT community anything on, on his shelves. He was not going to stop them from coming in or from selling them anything. But what he objected to was using his creative abilities, his time, and then to be compelled through speech because the cake... The court saw this, that it was, it was a kind of a speech. The cake represents something. But then also on cakes, there are messages. You have, you know, symbols there. Of Usually it's the bride and the groom. But if this couple in particular said, we, we want a symbol of a, of a groom and a groom, or we want a message that has both of our names, uh, Jack said, I can't do that. And the court agreed that that is compelled speech. So you have the perception that it was discrimination against an individual or a group. But the truth is, is that this was an event that Jack refused to participate in. He saw this as sacrilegious. So you have two very different views there, and the court took the side of Jack Phillips. And I think that was good, really a good, good uh, ruling 
uh, Ty, because it, uh, I- if it came down the other way, what this means is that states that have sexual orientation and gender identity protection laws, they could use that against any Christian business owner that had convictions on issues, not just regarding marriage, but on other things as well, where they're motivated not by bigotry or animus towards a certain class, but they're really motivated by their deeply held religious convictions. And uh, so, so even though some are saying it's a narrow ruling with narrow application, I think it was a broad ruling. Well, and that's where I was going to go because, um, again, I, I, I haven't studied it in depth, but just, just what I gathered yesterday on the news and, and reading a few things, that mm-hmm. uh, it, it was sort of a narrow-type decision in, in some uh, reporters, some media opinions out there, but you say it, it could be broader. Uh, than, than what uh, some are reporting. I, I think it is broader. I think this is going to be applied to, for example, photographers who refuse to do a photo shoot of a, of a gay wedding where their convictions say, I cannot use my artistic talents and abilities to, promo- to, to do an event that I find to be sacrilegious. It violates my beliefs. It's not that they wouldn't do, and I think... I, I, the, the facts in each situation need to be um, fleshed out, but... I think that this does have application in other, with other businesses. The photographers, um, you have the uh, the florists that are again using their uh, gifts and talents, um, and it it will be fact dependent. You know what are the facts in the case, um, and is this speech? It has to have an element of speech in it, um, and then I think there's the element of what are your religious convictions? How do they apply to this particular? Which, which one do you think played more in this decision, the religious conviction or the the, the, the speech aspect of it? I think there, I think both had an element. It seems to be the speech element. As I read the ruling yesterday, and I read most of it except for the dissent, everything but the dissenting ruling, and I'm going to get to that. It's a 56-page ruling. Who wrote page the dissenting opinion on that? Uh, the majority was written by Anthony Kennedy, but yeah. the dissenting opinion, it was just two of them. Mm-hmm. It was um, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, Sotomayor, oh, right. who wrote that. And I want to see what they had to say. Right. Uh, but the, the, the uh, thrust of it, though, was revolved around speech, because making a cake, and they had analogies about how cakes are their images, they represent a certain message. Most people, they don't even eat the cake. I mean, it's, it's a lot of it's bad, really. <laughs> Too much frosting or it just doesn't turn out good. Uh, but uh, it's more of a symbol. And then there's there's certain things with that symbolism, and there are messages written on it. And Jack Phillips just said, I can't do this. The symbol, the message. Um, it's interesting, too. it's fascinating, really, if you think about it. I mean, I think it's just, uh, it, it's really interesting um, to, to hear these opinions and, and see how it all plays out. And it's not the end of it, obviously. I mean, there will be more and more. Uh, of, of these situations that come up, and it'd be interesting to see how you know, because you know, I'm sure that it will it will go all the way to the Supreme Court again. It it could, and and I'm sure there there are probably some cases out there right now with different set of facts, and there are different <coughs> state laws that might be applied to to their situation that could right. make it up to the Supreme Court. The interesting thing about Jack Phillips, though, there was a personal aspect. So the speech aspect was one, but the personal aspect is that. When Jack created a cake for a wedding, he would bring the, the couple in to consult with them, as he did with this gay couple. Um, he would get to know them a little bit, their personalities, their interests, their desires, and he'd come up with something creative. The other thing, too, is that when he would bring the cake to the wedding and deliver it to the reception, um, he would hang out. He would s- actually celebrate with the people there. Mm-hmm. That's another element that people aren't aware of. And he said, I can't do that. I'm, okay. I can't s- be part of this. And, and again, I think we, can, we need to get our minds around the idea that just because you disagree with somebody's uh, views on something doesn't make you a terrible person. Just because you don't think something's right, a gay wedding is right, uh, and you don't want to participate doesn't make you evil. And that's something we need to... Jack is a very mild-mannered, very kind person. He just has deep, deep convictions when it comes to marriage and uh, how God defines marriage. He, he said, I can't cross that line. And, and uh, even if it means closing down my business, I'm willing to do that. By the way, he did close down the cake baking part of his business. He kept his bakery open, but he was just selling cookies and donuts and other things like that. Mm-hmm. So. Very interesting. <coughs> um, what, uh, 
So what kind of implications will this have, I guess, uh, as we move forward? Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you asked that because uh, this case has implications for Kentucky. There is a case yeah. right now in Lexington. Uh, Blaine Adamson is the owner of Hands-On Originals, and he was approached several years ago, about five years ago, by the uh, a gay pride uh, organizer in Lexington. They were going to have a gay pride event. They asked him to print T-shirts. Blaine said, I'm sorry, I can't do that, but I can find a company w with a similar product, similar price, same quality. I want to help you out. But the organizer of the LGBT pride event in Lexington said, no, we want you to do it. And they took him before the Lexington S uh, Human Rights Commission. They found him guilty. Uh, Blaine has been vindicated on a couple of levels. His case is before the state Supreme Court right now. And uh, I expect a ruling sometime soon. Uh, so, in fact, they might have been waiting for the U.S. Supreme Court to hand down their decision. But uh, this is a case where uh, Lexington and several other cities, as a matter of fact, have ordinances that uh, define LGBT as a protected class. And they say that in areas of housing, uh, uh, employment or in public accommodation, you cannot discriminate against this protected class. And uh, they applied it to Blaine Adamson's uh, business as a public accommodation, a business that would serve the community. They said, you violated this ordinance. You've declined their civil rights. You've declined to fulfill their t-shirt order. Therefore, we find you guilty. Well, there's more to it than that. There's more to it, as we saw with the U.S. Supreme Court ruling. I'm hoping we're going to see that with the, the Kentucky State Supreme Court ruling as well, where Blaine Adamson has deep religious convictions that say that he should not use his business to promote messages that uh, are antithetical to his beliefs. And by the way, in, as a matter of consistency, Blaine has declined to do T-shirts for things that he's found inappropriate, uh, frat houses that wanted to have inappropriate messages on them. Uh, and other type things. So there is consistency there. So this it's, it's a broad spectrum <coughs> of what he might uh, not hold with to his values that he has decided he's not going to print on these shirts. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, And this is important because it's not just one group that he is targeting or singling out, but it's a, it's a, matter, it's a uh, number of principles that he has, certain lines that he won't cross in different areas. And uh, I think this is the, the, the ruling, getting back to what the Supreme Court said, it's, it's good for all of us. It doesn't matter what side of the spectrum you're on, because essentially the bottom line is uh, one of the most important things that they said is that you cannot be compelled to promote speech that you disagree with or that violates your religious beliefs. And uh, that's something that we should celebrate and be thankful for. You know, freedom of speech is one of the great things that we enjoy here. In fact, right now, uh, you and I are enjoying it, we, we and the are. listeners are enjoying it, yeah. and it's a, it's a gift to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should treasure this gift, and we should also be thankful when the U.S. Supreme Court upholds rulings that, that uh, protect our freedom of speech. All righty. At 826, boy, it goes fast, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It, it does. But we came on a little bit later today, 88 mm -hmm. minutes after. We'll take a, a brief break here on Tiger Talk, mm -hmm. and we'll come back and talk more with Richard Nelson. He's the director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. And to find out more, uh, they have a website if you want to give that address. Yeah, it's uh, commonwealthpolicycenter.org. It's just the name of our group, commonwealthpolicycenter.org. Yeah, you can find out about uh, uh, what they stand for and what they're working uh, toward here in our Commonwealth. At 827, we'll take a break. We'll be back on Tiger Talk on the Tiger. Hancock's Neighborhood Market on Commerce Street in Katie's is the place to shop for delicious homemade goodness. Hancock's makes their own fresh chicken salad, pimento cheese, salads, and a variety of mouth-watering desserts sure to please your entire family. While at Hancock's, be sure to visit their meat department for the best selection of USDA choice meats in the area. Hancock's Neighborhood Market in Katie's, hometown, homemade goodness, and the Hancock name you know and trust for quality for your family. Hancock's Neighborhood Market on Commerce Street in Katie's. And at 828, we are back at another half hour or so here on Tiger Talk. It's the Tuesday edition, and Richard Nelson, the director of the Commonwealth Policy Center, in studio this morning. And, Richard, we'll shift gears now, and lots of things going on around the Commonwealth and different topics to discuss. And uh, you can go ahead and, and reel those off. Yeah, yeah. A uh, couple of good news stories. One is a uh, case out of uh, Arkansas where, regarding the life issue, the sanctity of life, we believe, is a pillar of society. And it's always good when the courts um, protect life. 
uh, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, about a week or so ago uh, handed down a ruling saying that Arkansas's uh, law that required abortionists who are doing chemical abortions, which essentially is an abortion drug, if they're dispensing that, they need to have hospital admitting privileges uh, at the local hospital. And that's in case something happens uh, so that they can take their patient, they have the right to go to the hospital and care for their patient there. Uh, and the court, when I say upheld it, they declined to hear an appeal to that law, which upheld it. And uh, that's good news when it comes to those states that want to protect the sanctity of life. This is one of those things we talked about taking things for granted. Well, Ty, you know, you and me and many of our listeners take for granted that we were probably born at a time when uh, life was protected, when abortion was not an option. Uh, I was born four years before Roe v. Wade, and so I just dated myself. For those listeners out there that want to figure out how old I am, you can do the math. Uh, I guess you need to know when Roe v. Wade was, though. Uh, But you know, we, we take it for granted that uh, we grew up in a time, or at least we're born in a time, where women, even in difficult pregnancies or in difficult situations, chose life. And uh, we're seeing, after 40-some years, of very liberal abortion laws. You know, for, for years, you could have an abortion for any reason, all the way through the ninth month of pregnancy, uh, and it was very widely available. And many people uh, said, you know, that's not right. Uh, you know, there, in, in a lot of the hard cases, let me take a step back here, a lot of the, a lot of the difficult cases of abortion, uh, it's the, the rape, incest, save the life of the mother, you know, that's 1% or less of all the cases of abortion. So that means that 99% is for matters of convenience or unplanned pregnancy or whatever. Um, which makes life just an option, and that's resulted in, the, in about 50 million, more than that, just closer to 60 million unborn babies have been aborted in this country since 1973. And uh, so we're seeing states respond to that. We're seeing states like Arkansas that have passed a common-sense law that just it simply says you've got to have admitting privileges to the hospital if you're going to be uh, administering these drugs. In the last uh, seven or eight years, there have been 400 state laws that are pro-life, that protect unborn life in one way or another. Here in Kentucky, we've had five laws that have been enacted in the last two, two and a half years uh, that affirm life, protect life. Uh, and these are good things, I think. We're seeing our, cult, our culture, our country embrace the idea that life is precious, that life in the womb is vulnerable, and that it should be protected by law. And that was, uh, you said that was Arkansas recently. That yeah. was. And yeah. it, did, did we have one in the Commonwealth this last session, or was it <clears throat> before? It, it, did, did something change, I think? Uh, there, there was a similar law, actually a friend of mine up in uh, Henderson, Robbie Mills, who's running for the state senate here, by the way. Uh, he's a state representative. He proposed a bill that would restrict chemical abortions, the, the um, dispensing of, of drugs for, for abortion. But uh, that did not pass. There, were, there was another bill, though, that did pass. It banned abortions after 11 weeks. It was the 11-week abortion yeah, ban. Now, that is being challenged. That has been challenged in the federal courts, and uh, there's going to be a trial in November. Uh, Andy Bashir is refusing to defend that law. It's the governor's office that is defending the 11-week abortion ban. Now, some states... Uh, have actually gone down to six weeks. The state of Iowa recently passed an ab- abortion ban. It's called the Heartbeat Bill. And it says that once a heartbeat is detected, you can't have an abortion. Now think about this for a minute. Uh, heartbeat, w- what, is, what is that an indication of? I'm just going to throw that out there. When you have a heartbeat, what is that an indication of? Uh, it's an indication of life. It, that something's alive. And so Iowa has passed a bill saying that when you can detect a human heartbeat, then you can't have an abortion. That's six weeks. And uh, that law is being challenged in the courts. So, so we see the, the legislatures, by and large, passing pro-life bills, and then we see challenges to these bills in the courts. But what, I, what I'm seeing happen, Ty, is that people are more pro-life. We're embracing uh, pro-life bills, we're embracing pro-life ideas, and if, if, if you're not sure about something, by the way, 
if there's a question, well, I'm not sure if that's really a human life, or is it, is it a sentient being? I mean, is, is it aware? Is it this or that? If you don't know the answer to those questions, it's best to err on the side of caution. It's best to err on the side of, hey, there is a human life. I mean, life begins at some stage, at some step. Well, biology tells us that it begins when that egg and the sperm meet and they create a zygote, and that's the earliest stage. It has all of the genetic material. It has all of that's necessary to be a, a human being. In fact, it is a distinct human being, but it isn't fully developed. It's not fully grown, but nor is the, the, the newborn baby just out of the womb. It's not fully developed either. It's just as vulnerable. Uh, it needs that mother's care. Um, and, and there are some even today who are saying, well, we think that parents should have the right to um, infanticide, as, as, as awful as that sounds, and as, and as uh, terrible that idea is, there's actually a, Princeton, uh, a professor at Princeton University, Peter Singer, who's advocating that parents should have, I believe, up to a year to determine whether or not to keep their children. Uh, and in a civilized society, uh, that idea is abhorrent, uh, I guess he's got the freedom to say that. If I was at Princeton or had was a board member or had my kids there, I'd say I don't think that guy belongs here because there are some ideas that are just so abhorrent that they they shouldn't belong in civilized society. And the idea that you should be able to kill your children uh, is one of those ideas. So we're talking about a move towards uh, restoring the sanctity of life. So instead of at birth or birth to a year to determine whether that child should live, we're saying, you know, life begins at conception, at that zygote stage, and it should be protected in law. And as we're seeing in, in other states, Iowa is the gra a great example, again, where they have uh, protected life. At, once you detect that heartbeat at six weeks, no more abortions. So we'll see how that pans out in the courts. And, and uh, I'm optimistic, though, that uh, we're moving in the right direction. Okay. Well, what else uh, uh, other topics are out there uh, that the Policy Center is monitoring and you all are closely... Uh, uh, watching different at different places. Yeah, some good news for Kentucky, uh, not just far from where we're doing this radio program, uh, is the Eddyville uh, State Penitentiary. Yes. And I actually, I'm going to be there this Sunday. I'm part of a prison ministry where I go in with a group and and um, we bring a message. There are church worship services, and quarterly I will go in and uh, minister to the prisoners with a group. It's and it's uh, it's really an awesome ministry. But uh, there's, there's an effort in Frankfurt. So here we are close to Eddyville, but there's something going on in our state capital <laughs> that would help to assimilate prisoners back into society. So right now, there are some 26,000 prisoners, and this is in the penitentiaries and in the jails across Kentucky. 95% of these people are going to be coming back out. They're not in for life. It's 5% or less that are in for life. And the governor has uh, introduced something called the Justice to Journeyman Initiative, where he's trying to help prisoners transition. And you can't just let them go and say, good luck, you're on your own. He's trying to find prisoners work. He's coupling, once they've done their time and paid their debt back to society, then he wants them back into society and working. And he's trying to couple them with trades that can mentor them. And the trades, by the way, need a lot of help. There are a lot of yeah, good-paying jobs out there, plumbers and electricians and masons and uh, carpenters, a lot of good, good tool makers, um, a lot of good jobs out there. And he's trying to find mentors for people in prisons to transition them back into society. And uh, this is a super... Uh, super initiative. What Governor Bevan wants to see uh, Kentucky become is something called a second chance state, where if you've messed up, if you have done wrong, if you found yourself behind bars, uh, that doesn't have to be the end of your life. Uh, he's saying, we want to give you a second chance. So he's done things like on state applications, taken off that felon box where you have to mark if you've been a convicted felon. Um, and that's not something that is a priority. Now, I'm not saying, uh, and I don't think the governor's saying that you just go in blindly and have a Pollyanna-type view that everything's all sunshine and lollipops and let's not worry about it. Let's go in with our eyes wide open. 
But let's also realize that if somebody's come out of prison, uh, they've done their time, and if they want to try to assimilate back in, if they want to work, let's help them along that path. Uh, Kentucky right now is uh, has one of the largest uh, unemployed workforces. This is uh, how, how do I how do they say that it's not unemployed? It's the um, we don't have as many people in the workforce as we could have since 2008. It's about 200,000 less that than we had back then, and these are working age people, uh, 18 to 60, who have just dropped out, and they're either living with somebody else that's paying the bills, or they're on the sidelines somehow. So the governor's trying to increase workforce participation, which I think is a good, which is a good thing. Are there other model states out there that are implementing these type of programs? Yeah, you know, I'm really not sure about okay. that. I, I would have to believe there are probably some out right. there. If not, then maybe we're a trailblazer. But uh, the governor really, and I really applaud him for what he's doing to uh, try to, in, 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 you know, help those people who have um, made some bad mistakes. They've harmed society. They've harmed other people. But once they've done their time, he wants to help them get back into society and um, become productive members, uh, contributing members. And, and I'm sure many <coughs> of those folks are um, have been rehabilitated at some <coughs> point uh, while they've either done their times, uh, you know, had time to contemplate what they might have done. Uh, you know, and, and, and just maybe have made the decision that, you know what, if I get that second chance, I'm going to make something of it. Yeah, I, there are. And I can tell you, uh, speaking firsthand, by being in the prisons and working with some of the men, speaking to them and interacting with them, I know that <clears throat> there are many who have had a change of heart. Uh, many have come to faith. Now, that will be borne out by their actions once they get out into society. You'll find out if they really have come to faith and repented and and are walking with Jesus. But um, there are many who I see that, that uh, have, have turned from that. Now, th when you go to prison, you're going to find a lot of people that are going to say, I didn't do the crime. I've been there. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen it where I've gone from cell to cell talking to folks, and hey, they want to tell you their story, <laughs> and they're somehow, they're innocent. Well... Uh, chances are they're they're not. I mean, there there are some people in prison who are, but um, the point though is that there are many people who have changed, and there are ministries in our prisons who are working to to help them. Many different, uh, not just Christian-based ministries, but there are other type efforts that are trying to help them get a GED, trying to help them with skills, trying to help them in other areas. Interacting with their family or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. and these are good things, they, and that's hard work. And, you know, when, boy, one of the last things many people think of is for their free time, I think I want to go to the prison and minister. I want to go behind four sets of locked doors and be patted down by the security guy and then go in with, uh, in some cases, convicted murderers, murderers on death row. And I've had that experience actually leading a church service with death row inmates around me. And you want to talk about something that is sobering is to be there in a room with people who, uh, who've killed other people. And yet uh, these, this group has uh, confessed that they're sinners. They've confessed that they've done wrong. They've uh, turned their lives around <clears throat> and they've repented from what I can see. Only God knows but uh, I've seen some of that change. I've seen a change of heart with some of these people. And um, I'm speaking from experience where there's actually one that I knew before or knew of through newspaper stories and news stories. And then I actually got to see him uh, at the Eddyville prison probably a year and a half, two years ago when I first started. There was a guy that I was speaking to that was in the group. And I said to myself, I know that guy. I recognize him. And Either it was from media, from media, from, media, yeah, from yeah. him being in the news, yeah. major case. It's actually nationally known, very yeah. horrific case. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't until after he introduced himself and said his name that it registered. Uh, and I don't, it took me quite a while, but it registered who that was. And I thought, oh my goodness, he really looked a lot different then compared to the pictures I saw in the media. I mean, it was almost a catatonic, demon possessed, <laughs> angry guy that I saw in the in the in the newspaper images and uh at, in the prison it was very very different, very different very different demeanor and and vibe that was coming from him I'm and sure you uh, can get in there and be humbled pretty quick 
It's very humbling. But but there's also guys in there, I'm sure that that aren't aren't humbled by it. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're, you, they're thrive and yeah. they and and they they continue their staying. But but what a neat thing, you know. I know there's there are several prison ministries and some close by that are doing just fantastic work yeah. in, in in our prisons. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's cool. Yeah, and that's a and it's a worthwhile ministry. Um, and, and there are many people in this area in the listening audience that um, are are aware of the ministry. Some might be part of it, but pray for those who go into the prisons. And I think that what they're doing there is uh, is it's incredibly valuable because they're bringing the gospel, biblical principles. They're bringing Jesus to prisoners who need to hear about Jesus. And um, when that happens, if you think about it, just from a purely pragmatic way. If you have people in the church bringing God to the prisoners, when those prisoners eventually come out, probably going to be in a better situation than if they were just left alone, just left to themselves, left to their anger and their bitterness and whatever thoughts they have of what they're going to do when they get out. When they bring the gospel into the prison and when people are changed, and there are some that are changed, there's no doubt about it, but when they come back out, that's an overall benefit to society. Sure, no doubt about it. All right, uh, let's take one more break, and we'll come back. We've okay. got about, uh, oh, 15 minutes or so left. We'll, we'll okay. see if we can't fill it up when we get back here on Tiger Talk. Richard Nelson awesome. is our guest. He's the director of the Commonwealth Policy Center on Tiger Talk on your hometown radio station, WPKY. Back after this. Since 1978, Perry's Floors and More has been selling, installing, and servicing homeowners throughout western Kentucky with quality flooring and workmanship. Perry's Floors and More carries luxury vinyl plank and luxury vinyl tile, carpet, window treatments, and more. Quality brands like Mannington, Shaw, Tarquette, Bowu, and Flexitech. There is a reason why we say you can walk on our reputation. Come see Bill and Lucy at 127 West Market Street or call 270 365 9 Eight forty-five, and we're about uh, fifteen minutes away from the top of the hour. And uh, this is Tiger Talk on your hometown radio station WPKY. And Richard Nelson, director of the Commonwealth Policy Center, our guest this morning. And Richard, uh, some more things in the news. Yeah, uh, Boy Scouts have been in the news again, and they've been in the news for the past several years uh, because of changes, organizational changes that. Um, uh, you know, allow uh, openly homosexual scoutmasters. They have defined down their moral code that requires the scouts to uh, be morally upright. Uh, they've allowed transgender um, kids to join. Uh, most recently, they've allowed girls to join the Boy Scouts, which is interesting because it started out as the Boy Scouts. Uh, they have also dropped the name boy uh, from their name. Uh, and this has led to a number of parents pulling their kids out. The 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 enrollment in the scouts has really the, declined. The national aspect of it all. That, guess, that's yeah. right, and it it varies at the local level. Not all of the local uh, troops have adopted, or they're having these issues. But at the national level, as a matter of policy, they have um, really strayed from their original mission. And the, their mission was to help young boys in an all male environment. Uh, become uh, skilled in the outdoors, but also to become civically minded, to be good neighbors, to help those in their community who needed help. Uh, and they, they came up with these different merit badges, and and really a good thing. Sure. Hey, by the way, the uh, the first Boy Scout troop in the United States was here in Kentucky, Burnside, okay. Kentucky, over in near Somerset. Okay, first first troop here. I know when I was at school at. Uh Murray State, you know, we had the National Boy Scout Museum was right there. I lived right across the street from it, and of course, okay. it moved later on. But that was that was pretty neat because yeah. I mean, you would have people from all over the world coming there to the National Boy Scout Museum. Yeah. Uh, speaking of people coming from all over the world, one of the controversies. So I said latest controversies. There have been probably three or four in the last just month alone with the Scouts. Uh, the latest is that next year the International Scout Jamboree is going to be held in this country. Yeah. And uh, as a matter of policy, the scout leadership has decided, you know, brace yourself. This is, just does not sound like the scout's doing this. But they're going to be handing out condoms to the participants. They expect some 50,000 boys and girls to be in attendance. And they've decided to hand out condoms. And that's the one of the latest things that has upset a number of parents. Again, we're talking about young kids uh, that are participating in this. So with, with the direction that the scouts are going in, um, parents have become frustrated, and they're looking for alternatives. So a few years ago, a group called Trail Life USA 
uh, started to give parents an alternative to the Boy Scouts. And Trail Life USA is really a Christian-based ministry where they seek to impart biblical principles to, to young boys and outdoor skills. Both of those things are going on. Uh, I think it's close to 500 troops across, con- uh, across, the, sta- across the country. Uh, there's a dozen troops in Kentucky. Closest one here is in Owensboro. But these are uh, usually they're, they're, they meet at a church or a church facility sponsored by churches, and um, they do have very specific moral principles. Here's what we believe. Here's the standard of conduct that we believe in. Very similar to the Scouts, except that moral compass, if you will, has been brought back um, very clear, front and center, as a part of their identity. It's called Trail Life USA. Trail Life USA, and they've got a website. I was just on it the other day. In fact, by the way, you're going to all hear a, uh, a Commonwealth Minute commentary I did on this uh, this week. Uh, but I was on their website the other day and um, reviewing it. It's very good, um, okay. very um, uh, clear. So if you just Google Trail Life USA, you'll probably find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good stuff, though. Search I mean, engine. Um, and it's good, you know, Ty, we were talking about this off the air just a few minutes ago, but it's good that there are alternatives. So what I just painted a picture of the Scouts, I mean, that's not a very flattering picture, and I'm not... I mean, this is what the scouts have done. I'm just reporting uh, what I see as a negative direction, the wrong direction they're moving in. Um, but it's good that we have alternatives. Sure. It's good that, okay, so there's a group out there that's doing the wrong thing or what I think is the wrong thing. There's an alternative here. And uh, that's the great thing about this country is that if you don't agree with one organization or the direction of a, that a group is going in, you can start another group. or you, There's an alternative for you. And in the case of the scouts, Trail Life USA... Is uh, is one of them right? Well, that that I mean, that, and that is that's that's what's so great about our country is, you know, we there are there are different uh, ways to to participate in different organizations to participate in, and uh, yeah, that Trail Life USA is is another alternative there. Um, are there any other types of organizations that you're aware of? Is that the main one that you at least have? If if uh, at this you point, you know, there are in the. Um, is it recent? Uh, the Trail Life USA is that pretty. It's recent? fairly recent. Within I want to say the last five or six years, okay. and it came down when when uh, I think when the when the Scouts opened up the leadership to homosexual Scoutmasters, and before that, you know, and I think it's worth talking about. Um, it wasn't a matter of the Scouts being against homosexuals. <clears throat> it's just that their standards and their principles said that we want role models of good moral character, and the Scouts said that is not good moral character. Now, I realize that's controversial, as I say that today, but the Scouts do have a right to believe that. They have a right as a private organization to have certain standards of its leadership and of its membership, and uh, even today that's, that's controversial. Yeah, sure. And and I think that uh, it, and there's a bigger discussion here, though, and it's it's are there moral standards for society, and if there are moral standards, what are they? Um, because as, as the path that we're going down, Ty, is a very dangerous path, and the path is this: uh, I, I don't think th- I, if it if it feels right to me. I should be able to do it, and you shouldn't tell me what to do. And if you disagree with me, you're the one that has a problem. You're bigoted, or in this case of the Scouts, you're homophobic, uh, you're intolerant. Uh, I should do what I think is right. And they'll elevate other terms like tolerance, respect, dignity, and those are good things. Uh, but those things without a moral reference point can become dangerous. You can, If you're saying, this hurts my dignity, or you're being intolerant, if you do not have a reference point for dignity or tolerance, you can make those terms mean whatever you want them to mean, and you find yourself one day in a society with no moral compass, with no moral boundaries, where anything goes. And we're moving in a very, very quick direction, very quickly in, in that direction, where uh, we don't have... Uh, a moral compass. And in order for any society to to long exist, to continue on, it needs to have a moral basis, a moral standard for right and wrong. Uh, and if you don't have that, then there's not much hope. Well, you know, um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good point. And of course, these are, these are the, uh, 
the, the opinions and the expressions of the Commonwealth Policy Center, again, uh, not necessarily this radio station management or ownership. Uh, we welcome any uh, group with an opposing view uh, to come on and, and, and speak as well, yeah. because these are issues that yeah. are, are controversial, and, and they're, they're issues that we're dealing with in our overall through, throughout society. But yeah. it, well, what's great is uh, this is a forum uh, where we can openly openly talk about them and and some people are going oh, I don't agree with that yeah. and some people are going yeah right on man but but mm -hmm. that's but that's you know that's 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 the society we live in the nice thing is or what I would hope is that we can sit down and and discuss our yeah. differences and 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 hash them out it just seems like here uh, you know, people d are closed-minded to others' opinions, and there, there's nothing that, that we can really discuss. You know, and we talked about this before we began the program, that uh, it's good that we can talk about these things. It's difficult for many people to talk about tough issues, emotionally charged issues, uh, issues that have a moral component to them. But we need to talk about them, and we need to do it in a civil way, sure. uh, with respect, affirming the dignity of the other person. And this is something that, in my work at the Commonwealth Policy Center, I have an opportunity to debate people on the other side regularly on, in open venues like this, on radio and on television. And one thing I discovered is that uh, if we uh, uphold each other's dignity, if we're respectful, we can go a long way. We can dialogue and we can have a conversation. But if we go after somebody else, if we demean them, if we uh, undermine their dignity, it's not going to go well. Uh, as a culture, though, uh, as a society, we need to uphold each other's dignity, and we need to engage in these conversations. It's so, so important to do that. It, look, ignoring these issues is not an option. Uh, I didn't make up this, the things that we talked about. I didn't make these things up. These are issues in the news, and we're trying to join these conversations from a principled conservative perspective. But we need to talk about them, and I encourage the listeners. I hope that you can talk about these issues around the dinner table, uh, in your workplace, wherever it's appropriate, uh, in your Sunday school classes, to talk about these issues with respect, with uh, thought, with uh, being careful. Uh, but we need to talk about them. Sure, we do. And if, you, if you're interested in anything you're hearing about or hearing about the Commonwealth Policy Center, they do have a website. It's called commonwealthpolicycenter.org, you, you know, www.commonwealthpolicycenter.org. You can read about them, uh, learn about what, they, what they're doing across the Commonwealth and, and really nationally because they, they touch on politics uh, that not only affect uh, us at the state level but also at the national level. And I, I <coughs> excuse me, I'll also let Richard again explain. He did at the beginning of the show uh, some of their principles. If you'll go ahead and, and tell the listening audience that might have come in late what the Commonwealth Policy Center uh, principles are and, and what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, yeah. Two of our two of our main goals. One is to elevate uh, principled conservatives to serve in our state legislature, and we do that by training them. Uh, in helping them to get elected to uh, primarily the state house. The other thing is that we're joining the conversations of the day from a biblical worldview, a conservative perspective that says this, that there is a God who gives us our rights and our liberties. The purpose of government is to secure our rights and our liberties, and that there is a moral compass. There is, there is a moral component to society, and uh, God is the one who gives us the rules to live by. Whether or not you agree with that, I, we have the freedom to do that in this country. But our founding fathers gave us a, 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 a political document, the Declaration of Independence, that acknowledges that we have a creator who endows us with inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's not government uh, that gives us these rights, nor is government the highest authority in the land. There's a God, there is a creator who is an authority above government, uh, an authority that gives us our rights. And we need to acknowledge these two principles. That's the genius of America, by the way, that our founding fathers acknowledged God, where he's part of our political framework, without imposing a national religion. And uh, that's, a, that's a gift that they, that they gave to us. No, no, so. doubt, no doubt about it. The Commonwealth Policy Center, www.commonwealthpolicycenter.org. You can read about their policy, what they're doing. They have a, a press release, a press room. Uh, some, you know, they also educate and train candidates to run for office. Yeah. Uh, they're very involved in our Commonwealth, in our government, and uh, to uh, do the things that, that Richard has expressed here. You just mentioned, if I could jump in and add, sure. you just mentioned training candidates. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Janine Hampton and I had a candidate training in yes. Madisonville just uh, the other day. Uh, we had candidates from all across, mostly western Kentucky, 
uh, some from, well, at least one from Louisville and maybe some from other parts, but a good group of people met in Madisonville where we were able to talk about how to run an effective campaign from messaging to fundraising to uh, working with the media. Uh, we talked about different components, and we may do another one of these. So, so if any listeners are out there thinking about running for office or even helping on a campaign, check out our website from time to time, or better yet, get on our mailing list. Go to commonwealthpolicycenter.org, and uh, on the right side of the page, you'll find sign up to get our updates, and we will keep you abreast of uh, training events and other things that uh, we're working on. And you can hear the Commonwealth Minute on our radio station uh, at about, or right before we go on the air in the mornings, about 6.45 or, or 5.45 or so here uh, five yeah. days a week on yeah. WPKY. So great. Hey, we appreciate you playing that, too. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much yeah. for being here. It's always a, a great show. Uh, yeah. It's always uh, very enlightening. Yeah. And... Uh, We certainly appreciate your time being here. Uh, All right. Thank you, Ty. It's been great to be here. God bless you, and God bless all the listeners. All right. That's going to wrap up this edition of Tiger Talk on your hometown radio station, WPKY. The Tiger, my guest today, has been Richard Nelson. He's the director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. Again, for more information, they're out there on Twitter and Facebook, and you can go to their website, commonwealthpolicycenter.org. We appreciate you listening to us. We're about a minute away from the top of the hour. That's going to wrap up this edition of Tiger Talk. Remember, tomorrow's Wednesday. It's our extension program, and... uh, We might have a surprise as well. And then Thursday, we have the high school rodeo folks uh, in here. Several kids participating in the Kentucky High School Rodeo. They've had some success and uh, some really good stuff going on with them. So look forward to that visit on Thursday. This is Tiger Talk on your hometown radio station. For Richard Nelson, I'm Tiger Bright. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hancock's Neighborhood Market on Commerce Street in Katy's is the place to shop for delicious homemade